Welcome to the Cuban Missile Crisis operational rules. So just some uh, rules that we're going to cover so you can conduct operations uh, on the map. The operational side to the um, strategic and policy game that's going on uh, in the simulation. So here's some, a couple of uh, units. The units in Cuba, uh, the Cuban and Russian units, uh, are typically turned over so they cannot be distinguished. Division-sized units are always visible. Uh, airstrikes cannot be conducted on units until they've been identified. Uh, units that are immobile, like the SS-4 and SS-5 and SAM sites, they become visible when a U-2 aircraft, uh, the one depicted here, passes over their hex. But in order to identify other units, uh, you'd have to have a, a reconnaissance unit with an, in, with an R indicator uh, that would do a low-level flight. A U-2 can only be attacked by SAMs. It cannot be intercepted by aircraft, where the low-flying reconnaissance aircraft can be intercepted by aircraft. And whereas the U-2 detects everything in a straight column of hexes, uh, low-level reconnaissance can only conduct reconnaissance on a single hex. But once they've identified a single hex, uh, units in that hex uh, can be uh, attacked. Uh, any uh, overturned or concealed units adjacent to an enemy ground unit are turned over, so they become uh, visible. So you can see here that the, uh, the U-2's got R for reconnaissance. Now some ground units uh, also have indicators on them. This is an airborne unit. It's got an A indicator, indicating that it can be uh, dropped uh, by aircraft. There are 10 transport air transport points, and one of them can be expended to drop this uh, unit. Uh, there are marine units, which have anchors to indicate that they can land on uh, beaches. Uh, these are army units, and they've got a T indicator, which indicates they can be air transported, which means they can be flown from the U.S. to a captured airfield. And all remaining units can be uh, transported uh, to a port uh, once they are deployed at sea. Uh, helicopter units would expend half of their movement points to go from the Florida Keys uh, to four more points to land in uh, Cuba. Air units have an air combat modifier on the top, air combat value on top, and a ground combat value on the bottom. And these numbers are interpreted very simply. If you roll equal to or less than the number, you destroy uh, the air target. And if you roll equal to or less than the lower number, you destroy the ground target if it is a battalion sized or less. Regiments, brigades, and divisions, such as this unit here, uh, cannot be destroyed uh, by aircraft. Some aircraft have a red N indicator, which means nuclear weapons. So for these aircraft, a 1D6 would be rolled, and that many steps of units would be destroyed. Most units have a single step. Some, such as divisions, can be turned over to the, uh, to the other side, reflecting a step loss. So a 1D6 would indicate how many would be destroyed. There are some units here, such as this Russian free rocket over ground, the Luna missile. These, uh, within a range of two hexes, uh, would roll a 1D6, and that many strength points of, of enemy forces would be destroyed. Not steps, but strength points. And once they fired, uh, those pieces would be removed. And the Americans have an equivalent unit here in the Pershing missile. It's got four steps. Every time it's fired, uh, the unit is turned over to its lower step, and it causes damage similarly uh, to the frog uh, unit. So the, uh, there's, there's three phases. There's the strategic movement phase, the movement phase, the combat phase. And in all of these phases, both the uh, Cuban-Russian or the American player can interrupt and apply either air power or nuclear weapons. So it's uh, completely interruptible. Uh, during strategic movement, uh, you have sea movement, air transport, airborne, and amphibious. An amphibious landing is uh, along the, uh, towards the hex indicated by the red arrows. And a marine unit can be landed at a beach. And uh, attacking a beach um, uh, uh, requires that once the unit lands, they must roll for combat every single turn, um, un, uh, rather rather continuously until a de decision is achieved. So with both amphibious landings 
And with airborne assaults, and here this is, indi this is indicated by the A for airborne, but you can also see the, the bird or, or parachute indicating this is an airborne unit. This airborne unit may also land on top of a hex and be used, con and, and, and the combat would occur continuously until a decision was reached. If ever an airborne unit or an amphibious unit is required to retreat, instead they suffer 50% losses. They, they lose a loss of 50% of their strength. So it's a, it's a sort of a risky uh, gamble to take. Now, the Cuban army is worth 50% of its ground value if they're attacked before the army mobilizes. And during that time, the Cuban military, before it's mobilized, may not move its ground units, may not conduct any air -to -air, uh, uh, ground-to-air fire, and may not deploy any of its aircraft. The surface-to-air missiles, depicted here by the SA-2, may fire against uh, targets after the Soviets have played their air alert card not before. So this is regulated by the uh, policy of the government. So each of the hexes here is 30 kilometers, and each of the turns in the game are uh, is, is one day. The first number on a ground unit is its strength, which is it uses to attack and defend, and the second value is how many movement points it has. And the cost for the different types of terrain are indicated on the uh, terrain effects chart, which is depicted here. And you can also see that there's a combat modifier which shifts uh, to the left or the right. Um, so Guantanamo, for example, shifts two to the left, which benefits the defender. So in order to um, uh, uh, determine um, how units move, uh, we need to know that every single ground unit has a zone of control they're surrounded. It's a six surrounding hexes. And whenever uh, a unit moves into an enemy's zone of control, it must stop for that turn. In subsequent turns, a unit may always move at least one hex. But within the same turn, no unit may move from one enemy zone of control into another zone of control. Aircraft also have zones of control. So if an aircraft is deployed next to an enemy airfield, and that enemy airfield has aircraft that launch. If those aircraft launch in the enemy's zone of control, then they must stop. And the way the air movement works is there's an action-reaction process. For example, the Americans can deploy an airplane, say this naval aircraft, to uh, attack this uh, airfield here, or rather uh, to attack this airfield here. And then um, the... Uh, this airplane would not then be able to escape. This Illusion uh, 28 does not have an air-to-air -air, uh, value, so it wouldn't be able to attack back, although this aircraft would be able to, uh, to attack it. Um, but uh, for argument's sake, here we have a MiG-17. This MiG-17 can then intercept this aircraft, and then in the U.S. reaction, the U.S. could send another airplane here to intercept that aircraft. And the uh, action-reaction process continues until all the aircraft are deployed. Now, to resolve the combat once all the movement's done, uh, all of the units in a given hex, you would roll less than their, uh, equal to or less than their attack value, and it, for, for every, every roll that, is, that achieves that range, you would destroy an enemy aircraft of your choice. Now, when aircraft are flying along, uh, they could be attacked. We look for a, a slight air. Here we have. Here on Havana, we have a light air defense unit. This light air defense unit would apply an attack value of one against any aircraft in the same hex. So if an aircraft were to fly into the same hex, uh, if the Cuban would roll one or less, this aircraft would be destroyed. Uh, for air aircraft that are passing through, uh, uh, each of these counters can attack each of the missions that passes through its hex. Now, for a high-value SA-2, a high-altitude SA-2, it attacks with a value of 2 in its own hex, and it attacks with a value of 1 in adjacent hexes. So if there's more than one SA-2, for example, if an aircraft were to pass here between these two SA-2s, each of them would get a shot at the airplane passing through. But the general rule is no air mission can be fired at more than once by any given uh, surface-to-air uh, missile or um, uh, uh, AAA uh, anti-aircraft artillery uh, unit. 
plus, once the aircraft have um, been placed upon uh, a hex, if that if the air defense unit hasn't uh, attacked that air unit, it may then do uh, once the aircraft has arrived uh, at its hex. So the uh, stacking limitations for aircraft are unlimited. You can have as many aircraft in hexes as as as, can, as 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 is desired, but no more than three regiments or brigades, or the equivalent of one division, may be deployed in a hex. So, for example, this unit here is the maximum that can be deployed, because a division is equivalent to three brigades. Uh, and that's on one of the charts uh, in the rules. So, some additional uh, rules. Uh, sea transport must start in a port. Uh, the unit would stay at sea, and then it would land. And this is typical for the uh, U.S. Marine Corps that would be used to seize, seize uh, ports. So, once the ports are seized, you could move uh, other U.S. Army units. Uh, directly from uh, the U.S. onto the uh, uh, into Cuba through those ports. Uh, there's air transport where aircraft where uh, ground units with a T on them that can be air transported or A for airborne can be simply flown in to air bases uh, within uh, Cuba. Um, but there's a maximum of ten because the U.S. is limited to ten air transport activities, and for amphibious air mobile. Um, and airborne units, they're automatically in supply the turn they land, but in the subsequent turn, they're not. And there are these markers, uh, which are airborne supply, and uh, there's a maximum of 10 of them, because they are 10, 10 tr air transport limits. You can put 10 of these airborne supply markers to keep units fighting. If units are out of supply, uh, in the case of uh, the Americans, if they can't trace a supply line, which is a line of, of hexes free of enemy zones of control, unless that enemy zone of control is occupied by friendly peace. So if they can't trace it to a friendly uh, air base or a friendly port, then they're out of supply. Cuban units, if they cannot trace it to a city, they're also out of supply, as are the Russian units. When a unit's out of supply, and this is determined at the beginning of movement for movement and the beginning of combat for combat, um, the consequences of being out of supply are half movement, um, half uh, attack strength and half uh, defense strength. Now, uh, airborne units can be intercepted by aircraft. So, uh, and and uh, uh, so, in general, air, airborne operations may not be flown through um, uh, enemy uh, air zones of control. Now, aircraft have unlimited movement uh, in the map. And uh, they can destroy battalion-sized units, which is why it's useful to identify the battalion-sized unit. That's another SA-2. This here is a, a brigade. That's another SA-2. Another brigade. That's a brigade. This here is a battalion-sized unit. It's got two lines here. So this, can act, this unit can be destroyed uh, on, in air operations. Now, air, aircraft can attack uh, ground targets directly through bombardment. They might also add their value um, to a ground combat. And this is in the form of, of ground support. But you can never have more aircraft contributing to, to uh, battle in, on the ground than there are ground units. So if there's three American or four American ground units attacking, you could have uh, a maximum of four uh, aircraft supporting the attack. So you can have multiple hexes attacking uh, one hex, and it's a simple ratio of adding up the attack values, uh, comparing it to the ratio of the defense values, which is the total of all the defenders in a given hex, and then you consult the uh, table that I showed in the uh, earlier presentation here, the uh, CRT or the combat results table. So uh, for combat, the um, the general rule is that when you calculate the defense effect of a terrain, you choose the single best, most favorable terrain effect for the defender. Some of the results call for a retreat. Uh, retreats may not do not, not be done through an enemy zone of control. Uh, if a unit chooses not to retreat, then instead it may lose half of its total strength. Uh, if all the defenders are destroyed, the attackers, or, or they retreat, the attackers may enter uh, into that hex. Um, now, there is a, an option, which is to, uh, these are the out-of-supply markers, if ever those become necessary. There are um, nuclear explosion markers for any hex that is affected by a nuclear uh, blast. Uh, and, it, of course, there, it depends on whether you've got air 
uh, mission, air nuclear missions, or whether you've got the frog mission, or whether you've got the uh, Pershing mission. But uh, for that turn, you have a uh, thermonuclear explosion. And subsequent to that, you have a radiation effects. Supplies may not be traced through that hex. It costs twice the amount of movement points to move through that hex. Any, any valuable victory points underneath that hex, like a city, are um, effectively gone. And uh, airfields and ports uh, lose their function. So let's let's conduct an attack here to see what what uh, type of attack we could uh, do here. Um, first, we'll, we would fly our. Uh, as you can see, a lot of these units are not visible. Here we have an SS uh, an SS five with an SA two on top of it. So the U.S. is going to do an amphibious attack. Uh, along these red lines, and you'll see that there's actually here a Komar patrol boat in Havana with uh, these three uh, Cuban units, which total up to the size of less than a division. It's two brigades and a battalion. So we're going to have two uh, regiments of Marines uh, landing here. We're going to have, uh, and recall, all of this would be invisible. So the Americans would have to speculate as to what the target is that they're landing against. Now, the presence of the Komar boat uh, or the um, coastal cruise missile gives a favorable one-column shift to the defender. Uh, and if you have both of them, it's still a maximum of a one-column shift. So we're going to put those two Marines uh, landing on the coast. We're going to have two airborne uh, landing uh, directly on top. We're going to send in uh, four aircraft. Now, until the Americans get permission to initiate nuclear conflict, they may not uh, drop nuclear uh, bombs everywhere. But we're going to assume that they well that they don't because they're trying to capture Havana, not to destroy it. So the uh, Americans will uh, have put four aircraft over this uh, site uh, for the time being. Now the uh, Cuban reaction is first to shoot at these aircraft with this SA-2. It's one hex away, and so they'd roll uh, f uh, four times against against each of these aircraft. And uh, at one hex range, the SA-2's effect is uh, one or less. So let's assume that one of the aircraft is destroyed. So this aircraft would be uh, shot down. And then uh, an, another, an additional aircraft would be sent to make up for that, and let's assume it gets through. And so we would now conduct our attack. We would add up the total number of attackers, uh, the values of the attackers. So we've got uh, 7, 7, and 7 is 21, plus 3 aircraft, which is uh, uh, 8 is 29. And they're defending against a total strength of uh, 10. Uh, yeah, 10 to 29, so that, that would be uh, 2 to 1 odds. And that is shifted down to an odds of 1.5 to 1 because uh, of the uh, Komar uh, boat that's there. And furthermore, uh, the defense is occurring uh, inside a major city, so it's a, a, a plus 2 die roll modifier. So uh, let's assume that the uh, U.S. rolls a 4 plus two, we have an exchange. Now in an exchange, the weaker party loses their entire strength, which in this case is the uh, the Cubans. So they would lose their um, infantry brigade, armored brigade, and their uh, air defense. And of course we forgot to uh, roll for the air defense, but this unit would have uh, an opportunity to roll five times against the five aircraft that were uh, that were operating uh, overhead, so these would be destroyed. The Komar in Havana is also uh, eliminated. And the Americans uh, choose to lose uh, one Marine and the armored airborne unit, and they've seized control Havana. And these aircraft remain here. At the beginning of the next turn, uh, they're going to be um, reassociated with their, with their territory with their uh, rather air bases. Now this is a helicopter unit. It flies in over here. Uh, this SA-2 would have a chance to shoot at it. Um, now normally uh, these units would, would uh, all be invisible because the Americans would not have been adjacent to those units. Yeah, 
even though it would all be invisible, except ones that were adjacent to uh, American units. Now, let us suppose that uh, the Americans conducted a landing here next to the SA-2 sites and the uh, SS-4 site. Now, in this particular instance, uh, this unit can simply advance to this location and it would instantly destroy uh, anything that it, it walked into if the uh, counters there, like the SA-2 and the SS-4, didn't have any uh, movement points. And the SS-4, if you see here, it's rather any any defense points. It's got a zero, so it's, uh, well, it's rather, sorry, the zero indicates that it's um, not activated, but this has no attack strength, and so the American unit can simply walk through these uh, other units. Now let's conduct a, a nuclear attack. Uh, this frog uh, would roll against this, and if, if they rolled a 1d6, an average of, of the uh, 1d6 is a 3.5. And so if 3.5, let's round that up to 4, points were inflicted on the 82nd Airborne, we could turn it over. Uh, yeah, and it would be basically, it's, uh, it, 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 would, it would need to be uh, removed. You'd need to satisfy the 3.5 loss, and this unit itself would be removed uh, off of the map. Um, from uh, from its uh, from its hex having conducted its operation. Now, in a subsequent turn, we have here uh, a regiment of Marines and a regiment of Airborne. Uh, the Marines and the Airborne could march out of Havana and walk onto the location where the SA-2 site was located. And uh, further American units could be brought in from the sea and land at the port at Havana. Uh, this uh, air mobile unit could uh, fly around uh, and land in another location such as on the SA-2 and move on top of this SA-2 and, and, and uh, effectively uh, eliminate them. This unit would become visible because it's adjacent to the uh, US uh, Marine Corps uh, units. So this is a, sort of an, an example here, a very short example of some of the uh, mechanisms for the uh, combat. Uh, of course, if the U.S. gets permission to use um, uh, initiate nuclear warfare, then things would look a lot more like this, where you'd have a nuclear bombing from the uh, U.S. Air Force. Again, the, the targets would have to be visible, so there'd be some use for reconnaissance aircraft. But with 1D6 for each of these aircraft, they could blow up entire stacks uh, in order to um, uh, have an effect. So it'd be quite powerful. So this is a, basically a very quick tactical overview of, this, of the system in um, the Cuban Missile Crisis.